uh, welcome everyone to the Land Management Committee of the Diversion Authority, Wednesday, March 27, uh, 2019. And we have introductions. I think we all, we all know who we are. Do we need to um, go around and, I guess we can. Let's, let's do that. Dr. Zimmerman, yes. Bob Zimmerman, City of Moorhead. Kevin Campbell, Clay County Commission. Eric Dodds, AE2S. Roger Olson, Cass County Joint Board. Mary Sherwin, Cass County Commission. Chuck Hendrickson, Martin City Council. Nathan Borbum, City of Fargo. <clears throat> Shelley Byron, City of Fargo. And on the line we have... Jenny Mongeau, Clay County Commission. Thank you, welcome Jenny. Okay, hey, yes. Yeah. Commissioner Strand. John Strand, <clears throat> Fargo City Commission. Thank you for being here. Okay, uh, we have your agenda. Are there any additions or changes to the agenda? See, Mary, I have one item. Um, agenda item number five indicates that there may be an attachment. There is not an attachment, but I will address uh, just verbally given. Great, thank you. Anything else on the agenda? I have a motion to approve. Approval. approval. Thank you, second? Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 And the motion carries. Item number three, the minutes from the previous meeting. We've had an opportunity to review them, hopefully. Is there a motion to approve? Move approval. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Any discussion changes on the minutes? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Opposed, mm -hmm. same sign. Minutes are approved. Item number four, property acquisition status report. Item B in your packet. Eric, is that you? Yep. So in your packet here, and this I believe was emailed out as well last week, uh, you see a property acquisition status report. It's a number of pages. The first two pages include a couple maps. The first map is an overall status indication of where we're at um, on the acquisition for all the parcels. And, and you've probably seen this in the past, but just to refresh your memory, green is good. It's kind of a muted green, but the green means we've acquired it. The purple, and there's a couple purples on the north end of the channel. Those are properties where we have a purchase agreement signed and we're just waiting for closure. Uh, the blue parcels are thing are parcels where we are in negotiations. So the appraisal was done. Most of those appraisals were uh, done several years ago, and we're trying to negotiate based on the old appraisal and sort of seeing how those how that works out. And then the uh, south half of the channel you can see is a lot of a tan color, and that means those appraisals are pending. That's the batch of appraisals that was recently assigned to three different appraisal firms. And so those are underway. The appraisers are making contact with property owners and getting started with that work as we speak. And then scattered throughout the area, you can see you know, the status on other parcels as well. As well. There are a number of yellow shaded parcels on here that are associated with the biogeo monitoring. That's really environmental monitoring that is needed to sort of establish a baseline environmental conditions for the, uh, for the area, for the rivers and streams in the area before construction gets started. Um, we have to get easements on those parcels. So that's the first page. The second page just is more of sort of a color category of, of of how we've broken down the acquisitions into each um, area of the project. And so there's three phases for the channel, uh, the southern embankment, there's three different control structures as well as the embankment itself. You can see uh, generally some of the other areas on there as well. And then um, the following pages just provide a, a bit more uh, detail about each one of the sites. Um, each one of those sort of areas that we've get into. And so I won't go into a whole lot of detail here, but this is uh, what we plan to produce on a monthly basis to show status and sort of track status of the acquisitions as we move forward. So uh, you'll see that there's you know, good progress made in certain areas and you know, progress to be made in other areas. Uh, we are tracking some budgets on this sheet as well, and we're 
making sure that the budget is synced up with the financial reports that the finance committee and the board see in, in their packets. So um, happy to answer any questions if you have any. Eric, on the, um, on the, um, the, the lands that you were talking about for the yellow, the monitoring, yep. on the Minnesota side, are, are, are most of those already properties that are, belong to Clay County, do you know? Or? The only properties that we are showing in that category right now in Minnesota are the government-owned properties. There are some additional biogeo sites in Minnesota that are private property and we have not yet requested right of entry or any easements from those property owners yet but that's definitely something that will be done as we move forward. Have, do we have an indication as to where those need to be and what properties those are? Um, I don't have it at my disposal but yes that's basically comes from a list from the Corps of Engineers they have identified where they need to monitor which rivers and which locations and they identify uh, the parcels specifically that they want access to for placement of some some monuments that they can use for long-term sort of record keeping you know what's the environmental conditions at this site and then they go back every number of years to keep monitoring and and What's the time period for those want being implemented or wanting to be implemented? Um, I think we've been sort of keeping that on hold intentionally until uh, you know, we get through some of the permitting processes in Minnesota, and I guess you could argue maybe we're there now, uh, but right now that's in the core's hands, and I think they're... Um, working towards giving us those boundaries and asking us to proceed with getting uh, those property rights uh, my anticipation is they'll do they'll make that request of us in 2019 and then we'll be working with our our teams to get out to property owners hopefully later this year and get access for the beginning of that monitoring work okay thank you anything else okay any other questions on, on the acquisition status report? Then we will go on to item C, which is the lands outreach update. Yeah, and again, nothing specific in your packet on item C. I did want to provide a uh, sort of a brief update. Um, a couple weeks ago, we sent out roughly 550 letters to property owners whose <coughs> land is affected by the project. Uh, we've been receiving phone calls from those letters. It hasn't really been overwhelming by any means. I think there's a, maybe three dozen or so property owners that have called. Um, most all of them have been from the upstream mitigation area, and it's been on both sides of the river. Um, most of the property owners that are calling are asking questions about the process, wanting to know what the steps are, and many of them are sort of anxious to move forward with the process and so they're asking to be put on the appraisal list and um, you know kind of proceed with the process and so I think that's generally a positive trend it's not unexpected I think that's what we anticipated and and so it sort of validates maybe the, the thoughts we had and um, again most people that are calling I would say nearly all of them have been very appreciative um, you know, of getting more information. Some of them expressed frustration, what took you so long to get to us, and you know, probably fair criticism. Um, so it, in general, I'd say it was a worthwhile effort and something that um, you know, the property owners have appreciated. Also, related to that, uh, there's a follow-up letter that the Water Resource District will be considering tomorrow morning, providing the property owners along the channel a little bit more detail about the channel properties. That's an area where we are sort of knocking on property owners' doors, saying, you know, hey, it's it's time, we're ready to acquire your property. And so that's, um, you know, just a little bit different approach, I guess. <coughs> we're knocking on people's doors versus, you know, them calling in response to a general invitation. And what's the timeline on the channel? On the channel letter, our goal has been to acquire all the channel properties by spring of 2020. Um, and that, that's a fairly aggressive goal. Uh, but we are, that goal is sort of established in part by the desire to be ready for the P3 contractor. 
And so if we're able to proceed with the P3 procurement and get the P3 developer under contract, we'd like to be able to turn them loose and have the, you know, provide them access to all of the lands for the channel. And so that's, you know, those two things are synced up with the, um, with the goal of getting those properties acquired by spring of 2020. We will be discussing that timeline a bit tomorrow morning with the Water Resource District. And <coughs> I know um, some of the Water District's attorneys are you know, reviewing that timeline as we speak. So. And what about the fringe areas? How are we handling those folks that are kind of in that gray area? Yeah, um, in the letter that we sent to property owners on the upstream side, we, had, we indicated to them that uh, we have to get <coughs> FEMA to final, you know, do, do a final approval of the hydraulic model. And it's my understanding that we're going to be ready to submit that model to FEMA here in just a matter of a week or so. And FEMA will likely take <coughs> two, three, four months to review the letter and to review the hydraulic model. And so until FEMA is done with their review, we have you know, while we're abundantly confident with the hydraulic model, there's always a chance that FEMA might ask some questions or make some slight tweaks or things. And given that we're talking about the fringe, we are hesitant to put a final, final stamp on the impact area until we get that FEMA blessing. And so our goal would be to have that done by summer time frame. Um, and a number of the people that have been calling are on the fringe and we're having to make some judgment calls between wanting to proceed and so it will be a good day when we have that FEMA blessing and we have a little bit more certainty about where the impacts are and where they're, they're there or not. Great. Um, thank you. Any other questions about the outreach? <clears throat> are there any other letters that we plan to do? Or anything in the near future? I, you know, we have also gone out and met with some townships. Um, other than the letter that we intend for the Water Resource District to send to the channel properties, um, nothing in the near term. There will be multiple other letters that go out to property owners as the design advances and as we get more information about the, uh, you know, the FEMA approval. <laughs> Um, and as the Minnesota entity is established, in, but you know those are all probably at least a month or maybe several months before we're ready to send anything. Else to yeah. Okay, great. Anyone else have questions? Okay, then item number six: upstream mitigation development restrictions in the maximum pool D in your packet. So the. In your packet here, there's a map, and then following the map, there's a sheet of sort of definitions. You've probably seen this before. This was in previous packets. This is the map that was sent to property owners in the upstream mitigation area. Um, we've been having some ongoing discussions with the permitting agencies, both, I guess, locally, the you know, Buffalo Red Water District, uh, the DNR, and the State Water Commission. And there has been um, a bit of continued discussion about what development restrictions are going to be required in the maximum pool, which is the purple area on the map. The maximum pool is defined by what's called the probable maximum flood. And so that's really a sort of a biblical type flood, seven times the size of the 100 year flood event. So very, very large, but it's it's necessary when you consider dam safety conditions or dam safety requirements. And so given that we've had a number of property owners calling who have property impacted by that purple area, there, you know, some people are asking, well, I was going to build a machine shed or I wanted to, you know, relocate a house or, you know, that sort of thing. Thankfully, they're calling and asking, you know, how, what is this development restriction you speak of and what does that mean in terms of elevation and the like? And so on the second page, you'll see the letters PMF highlighted in yellow. That yellow highlighted edition is new. It was not in the information sent to property owners, but as we've continued to you know, understand these conditions a bit further, 
Um, our interpretation now is that any future development will need to be above this biblical flood or the PMF flood level uh, associated with the project in operation. And so what does that mean, I guess, is maybe what I want the committee to be aware of and have some discussion about. In some areas upstream, that PMF flood is four or five feet above existing ground conditions. And so we will be asking property owners if they want to build a machine shed or a home or whatever it might be, that they would, you know, we, we have to acquire an easement and the easement will have these restrictions on future development and that future development will then have to be four or five feet above existing ground. And the, and the, the height above existing ground varies no matter where you are, of course, but in general, I think that's, um, you know, kind of a, well, in some situations it will be in that, height range um, and so that might be alarming to some folks but recognize we're wanting to make sure that in the event we ever had this biblical type flood we don't have properties that are impacted by the project and so it's tough to think you know sit here and think that you know we're never going to have a biblical flood um, but, you know, hey, it happened in Houston, you know, with the hurricanes and they built homes that were maybe at an elevation lower than they should have been when you see all these news stories. And so this is probably, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. Um, we're trying to avoid that situation here locally. So I wanted the committee to be aware of that because um, there's kind of a practical, you know, on the ground level of what that means, especially since we've been getting some phone calls. So would that be the same kind of flowage easement that we'd put on the rest of? So the flowage easement in the tan colored area, which is the operating pool, we will have a prohibition on development. That's floodway. Basically floodway. <clears throat> so no development, no structures in that tan area. But in the purple area, you could develop. It's just the development needs to be you know, it, it on be stilts or whatever. It becomes basically a a defined floodplain area, yep. right? I think is a, maybe a way to look at it where right now within the floodplain you can build, but you have to build to certain right. specifications. And it's just, I think you're spot on. It's just that the requirement here is normally the floodplain is concerned with the 100 year flood. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about a flood that's much, much larger than the 100 year and so you know, it's kind of a new standard, but again, it tied to the dam safety conditions. And um, so, would this compensation be something that our phase two is looking at? Right. So, our phase two flow easements will take into account all of this information, you know, all of the restrictions, um, and they'll you know fit that into their formula for valuing these easements. One of the things that sort of a concept out there that um, we've been thinking about in these situations where perhaps there's just a portion of a parcel that is impacted by this flow easement and this uh, development restriction we would need to get technically what we need to get is a property right on that portion of the parcel and if the property owner is indicating that perhaps he wants to build a machine shed or you know, a house or whatever, and our, our restriction is they need to elevate that structure, there's some cost associated with elevating that structure. And so perhaps one opportunity for us to um, allow that structure to be built up higher as well as get the, develop or the, the property right that we need is perhaps instead of buying you know, some valued easement through an appraisal process, perhaps we could offer to pay for the fill, for example, or pay to, you know, or reimburse them perhaps for the fill to raise that house up. And so they're able, they're able to build their home. We provide the, the stilts, if you will, to build the home up on, and then they're able to continue with their development. Along with that, we would have to get the easement that, you know, provides the legal authority to have this water back up in the event we have a biblical flood. And so that's something that, um, you know, the permanent agencies have basically told us you need a property right. And if that property right is defined by, you know, reimbursing for fill, or if it's defined by some, you know, appraisal science, uh, you know, that would work as well. 
but I think you know this is maybe another example where we might have some flexibility in our toolkit. Questions on that? I just want to talk about grain bins. Um, you don't have to go very far away, and you see grain bins that have ruptured that have been in floodwaters. So certainly, there's been some talk about maybe we can leave bins or buildings and protect. Uh, you know. I think the elevation of these um, structures are important. It's total destruction of that grain and the grain benefit if it gets wet. Um, so that's important. So we've had some discussion at a sort of a staff technical level as well about you know what constitutes an insurable structure, and I think as we boil down into that, it's basically basically anything. You know, we, at one point there was talk, well, maybe it's just residential structures that need to be elevated, but that's not the case. It's really any insurable structure. And, you know, is a doghouse insurable? Maybe not. But is a three-sided barn, probably could argue, is a four-sided barn? Yeah. Is a grain bin? I think, yeah. Um, and so that this, this uh, sort of application of development restrictions and mitigation of structures applies to farm structures as well. I do think we have a little bit more flexibility on non-residential structures in terms of alternative mitigation rather than just simply a buyout or uh, elevation. We could consider dry flood proofing. FEMA has some guidance on dry flood proofing. We could consider wet flood proofing. FEMA, again, has some guidance on wet, you know, for example, if you've got a machine shed or a shop, perhaps it's okay to allow floodwaters to come into that building as long as it doesn't damage the building and the electrical is up high and you know, those types of things. Um, and you know, there'd have to be you know, sort of vents to allow the water to come in and out of the structure. And so those are some nuances that we need to do a little bit more research and development on. Um, but if it allows the property owner to keep their operation where it is and it avoids a really expensive buyout um, it, given the uh, infrequent nature of these impacts, perhaps that's a tolerable mitigation solution. And that's in the purple area. Yeah, in the purple area. Yep. 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 So in some of these places, you've got outbuildings that have been there forever and yep. repurposed and used to be grandma's old chicken coop. And I mean, they've really outlived their useful life. Sure. I mean, how do we, you know, but they're still used. In some way, I mean, in, know, how do how do we handle those? So, from an appraisal standpoint, the appraisers will look at you know all the structures and all the values. Some of the structures will have contributory value; other structures, frankly, probably will have very little contributory value or maybe a diminution of value. Um, and so, it'll be looked at from a market standpoint. You know, if that structure is still in good use today. Um, you know, I think that gets accounted for in the appraisal process and certainly through the negotiations uh, just because your chicken coop is old and you've, you know, whatever, it, it, there's still a value to it to the property owner. And so that becomes a bit of the art in this process. Um, Eric, are there any historic properties that we need to be paying attention to? Yeah, absolutely. There's... And maybe I don't know, Nathan or Bob can add on to this, but the Corps is required to do a historic property survey and identify all the historic properties. And if we do, if we do have to acquire a historic property, we have to work with the Corps and the state historical offices to make sure we're properly mitigating for that historical significance. Sometimes that might be you know record keeping. Sometimes it might be you have to preserve it. Um, you know, so I think there's kind of a suite of details that we get into. And how about cultural? Uh, I know since Plan B and the different route, are we and maybe this isn't this is the right time for that, but are we uh, crossing those T's and dotting those I's relative to cultural in, uh, locations or Native American sites? Or? Yeah, so along the channel where the alignment has been established and we've known about it, there are a few cultural sites that have talked some about in the past, and those are well known, and there's been um, you know, preliminary efforts made to 
identify the size and the scope of that. Uh, there's a future effort needed to actually you know, do the archeological dig on those. For the embankment alignment, there's been some of the cultural surveys done, but there needs to be more of that cultural survey work done to identify the, or survey the areas where the alignment has changed. It would, it would seem to me the more proactive we are in that, the less likely we are to hit uh, walls later with the folks we need to communicate with. We were hoping you would volunteer. I'd, I'd be really happy to, <laughs> again. And now it's maybe time to pick that up. Yeah. Let me know. And, well, and along that same line, when do we start to um, talk about cemeteries again? I, I know we've drastically reduced the number of impacted cemeteries, um, but we still have a, a few that we uh, need to meet with somebody about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's, I mean, we could, we could start a, reassembling the local cemetery mitigation team probably at any time, given that several of those cemeteries are in the upstream area perhaps we uh, you know want to make sure we get that fema blessing of the hydraulic model before we go you know too far down the path but um, if we look back at the local cemetery mitigation team many of the diversion authorities members on that team have sort of come and gone we had you know daryl vanio and um, i'm forgetting even you know some of the other members but you know people that Chuck is still here, but other people had sort of done their time, I guess, and so uh, um, you're right. We do need to reconstitute that group and, and um, move forward with meeting with those cemetery property owners. I think when I go to public meetings, those are some of the criticisms, <clears throat> if you will, is how am I going to be affected, you know, specifically, whether it's a fringe area, whether it's a grain bin, whether it's a cemetery. So the more we can reach out, the sooner. I mean, we haven't been able to in the past because we weren't really going anywhere, but we should probably ramp that up now. Okay. And maybe you can take a look and see who's, who was on that and yep. who needs to volunteer. I'm looking down at Commissioner Strand there a little bit. <laughs> we probably have some relatives in some of those cemeteries, so <laughs> it's fitting. Perfect. <laughs> well, I do have. Okay, um, anything else on the mitigation, upstream mitigation? Okay then, crop insurance, item E. Uh, in your packet here is a letter uh, along with some supplemental information. This letter was sent to the uh, House Appropriations Committee in, in Bismarck um, a week or two ago in, in response to a handful of questions that the committee had regarding whether or not crop insurance would be available for producers in the upstream mitigation area. Um, and so fortunately, through some of Roger's good work several years ago, we have some documents that are attached to that letter. These documents are from the USDA's Risk Management Agency. It, it's sort of a complex situation, but basically what the uh, documents say or the letters from uh, USDA indicate is that as long as a producer is able to plant their crop in accordance with USDA's planting guidelines they are then eligible for federal crop insurance. The documents go on to say if the project operates and, Im and, 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 and impacts growing crops that they would likely be ineligible for federal crop insurance from a man-made event. And so that's really why the Diversion Authority has committed to establishing the Summer Operation Supplemental Crop Loss Program, which is kind of like crop insurance, although we didn't want to call it crop insurance because we're not asking anybody to pay a premium. Um, and so there's that information about the summer crop loss program in this packet as well that went to the House Appropriation Committee. And so, um, you know, this is something that we've, we had developed, you know, quite a while ago. Fortunately, we had good answers to the committee questions and um, we wanted to make sure this group was aware of that conversation. And then, you know, Roger, I think you had a few other points about, you know, how does this work out in the field for producers and the yeah, um, 
again from the information that that was sent to us and just from um, using the program over almost 40 years of farming I, I can understand um, the program and how it works I think Eric did a pretty good job of, of assuring us that if if the farmer can if we operate the project and the land dries up and the farmer is able to put it put his crop in within the window of insurability then that crop will be um, insured through multi peril crop insurance if um, if the if it operates and he is not able to plant it because of the project it didn't dry out then um, because of the project they would not would not be covered under multi peril and there was some other discussion in here too about if the project operated and then the outside area was planting and there was a window to plant um, and you didn't you didn't plant for whatever reason um, you would not then be um, insured so what what the insurance company is or what the government is saying is we we'll want to we want to provide you with insurance but you can't say that you were prevented from planning because your equipment wasn't working or wasn't big enough to get the job done in the window that was provided. So they have uh, gotten more stringent on those rules. They, um, they have kind of tightened those things up. Although uh, um, if it's a general, if there's general loss in the area, they become a little more lenient. But if you're the only one, um, they're going to really scrutinize your um, insurance. I think these documents do really cover the uh, <coughs> insurance really quite well. And um, yeah, we'll just I think there's uh, some implementation. Yep. Committee is going to be looking at uh, mm -hmm. how to implement this. So. Right. Yeah, in the in the uh, permit from the DNR, one of the conditions is that we need to uh, provide a bit more detail on this crop insurance program. And I forget the exact dates, but there's some timelines included in that permit. And so we, we knew we needed to do that, and the DNR is sort of holding, their, holding our feet to the fire, which is a good thing because we, we need to do that as well. So. I can't imagine how you'd calculate a loss like that. It just could be beyond my fathom. Thankfully, there's so federal crop insurance is a you know federally subsidized program, and they have I believe there's seven or eight what they call reinsurers throughout the country, and I think generally two of them operate here locally, and so they go out and every year I believe they ask producers you know what crop are you growing, how many acres, what type of coverage do you want to apply for and so there's kind of a system and a structure in place for people to sign up for crop insurance the concept that we have is we will develop a, a rider essentially for those reinsurers to go out and sell not sell but offer at no cost to the producers and then in the event there is a summer event or summer you know rain event that is so massive that it would cause you know water to run off to the river the water to go down the river to the extent it's going to uh, threaten the community we have to shut the gates or you know partially close the gates and that causes water to back up upstream at some point there'll be a, an insurance adjuster who has this universe of data trying to you know make heads or tails out of it of you know whose fault was it was it the rain was it the you know the the runoff was it the backup you know what caused the actual crop loss um, that's going to be a complex algorithm, but thankfully the insurance market, you know, they deal with these things. That's their profession. And so our goal was to sort of just um, piggyback on that structure that's already in place today. And I don't, made, I don't mean to make it sound so simple, but, uh, you know, in concept anyway. And then if, if the adjuster says, 
all right, uh, diversion authority, you guys are you know twenty five percent responsible or seventy five percent responsible, then uh, you know we're on the hook for for paying for those crop losses. And we've also proposed in our uh, summer crop loss program that we would cover ninety percent. In my understanding, as most producers generally purchase somewhere between seventy and eighty percent coverage. Yeah, that's that's correct, 70, 70 to 80 percent. So this program would go above and beyond that and cover it at 90 percent. Uh, and it, it would be based on individual farm yields and whatever their, their insurance says that they're guaranteed. Um, that's, that's the program that we would follow for um, compensation. And it would be at the 90 percent level. I, I have had some conversations with the Ag Department at NDSU recently asking if they have the expertise to help us advance the development of this crop insurance rider program and waiting for them to get back to me. I think they'll probably get back here in the next day or two. Um, if they have the, the local expertise, I think that would be great. They may need to team up with somebody like Watts and Associates who really you know, sort of develops crop insurance products. Um, but there'll be some some uh, you know work for the diversion authority to you know create this program, create the rider, meet with the reinsurers, get it established as an official rider that they can go offer to property or, or to the producers. That is. So this May fifteenth for canola is that reasonable? I, I I'm not a farmer, so I'm looking at the farmer here. So these are the the, uh, the final planting dates that USDA established, and I think this is probably from a few years ago. And so I presume these dates probably had fluctuate a little bit from year to year. Little, they have changed a little bit. Yeah. My understanding is generally farmers try to be well ahead of these late planting dates, but from an insurance standpoint, these are well established, sort of university research driven dates that. Uh, uh, you know, the market sort of accepts, I guess. I don't know, Roger, you're, but you're I, the expert. I guess what I'm asking is, are you, if you had the big flood, is is that enough time to dry out your field and get in there and take care of business? Well, there's a provision within the insurance that allows for planting after that last date. Okay. And it's, it's um, a late planting window which reduces uh, your coverage by 1% per day up to when you can actually plant or when you certify that it's planted. So there is a window to do that, but there is, a, there is also a, a cost uh, on the insurance side, not a cost, but a, a loss in coverage if you did end up with a loss. So. Maybe two other points that I would add on that question. When we worked with the NDSU egg team about the, the, their egg study, they held a focus group with producers and asked about how much time does it take from the time the water is off the field until the time you can start planting or you know, you know, getting on the field. And the general takeaway was probably plan for 10 days. And that 10 days includes the time for you know, dry up, debris removal, you know, variety of different activities. Um, you know, in some situations it could be shorter, some situations it certainly could be longer, but the conclusion was to assume 10 days for that dry down period. And so if we think back about our flood events here, I think the, the latest crest on record was 97, and that was April 17th was the crest. Now, the water didn't obviously leave the field. I don't know what date the water actually got off of, you know, below flood stage. Um, say it was, you know, April 25th or something. Um, these dates are still significantly beyond, you know, those late April dates. And so that's why the NDSU group felt like from an annualized standpoint, the risk of having a delayed plant was really small. They did acknowledge that in some years there could be some overlap of the planting time frames with the time frame of when the flood waters leave the land. But from a 
you know, recurring annualized basis, that risk was very small. And now recognize we've we've changed the operating frequency from once every 10 years to once every 20 years, which further makes that risk even more remote for a, for an impact of planting dates. Just one more comment. Another thing NDSU looked at was the switching of crops from maybe your intent was to plant corn, but because of the later the later um, planting date, you could move into soybeans, and they looked at the economics of that, and it, it, it was um, s small, spread over the um, number of times it's used, so, or the frequency. And those two factors, the dry down period and the switching of crops, is something we specifically talked with NDSU about recently, and they're going to, uh, as they're, we're, we've asked them to put together a proposal for updating their study, and those are two specific items that we'll be asking them to review and perhaps consider some sensitivity. Instead of just 10 days, maybe they look at 10 days plus 14 days and see how sensitive their model is to a delayed planting scenario. So is the 90% compensation, is that a reasonable compensation? Um, you know, or it, do you take into account that we've compensated them with a flow adjustment? I mean, I, I that'd guess, be my first question is why 90%, why not 100%? Um, yeah, I think that's probably a fair question. I guess recognize that most producers are typically buying, you know, 75%. And so going beyond that was, you know, maybe a recognition that, you know, we have some responsibility here. Uh, why didn't we go to 100? Um, I, I suppose that's debatable. Keep in mind that this crop insurance program is really for the producer. The flowage easement is for the property owner, which may or may not be the producer. Um, and so we're you know, really kind of trying to be fair and try to safeguard the producers. But at the same time, if the producer knows that he has this insurance provision against a catastrophic loss, he's more likely then to be comfortable paying a decent rental rate for the land, which then helps the property owner sort of absolve that risk as well. And so we think there's a lot of value to this summer crop project. Commissioner Sherling, we did have that discussion in our ag committee with, with the farmers. And this discussion went to, well, you should cover 100%, like you just mentioned. Um, some of the other farmers said, well, we would probably have an advantage then in this area, and we, it might bring in competition because uh, you're actually covering 100% of the loss, and we're normally we can only afford to do 70 to 75 to 80%. So there was a mixed mixed uh, message coming out of the um, committee, but um, yeah, that competition thing. It could could open up if hey I got nothing to lose you know I'm going to pay a little more. What do you mean by competition? Uh, outside farmers, other farmers coming into the staging area, so that he would they would compete with the farmers that are already there, farming it, and maybe um, bid up the rent. Okay. Interesting. So I think ninety percent. We we talked about. I think ninety percent was. I think most felt comfortable with that. Interesting. Thank you for clarifying that. I have, a, I have a question. When was the egg meeting that you were talking about? Was this the one that had met several years ago or recently? Uh, that was several years ago. Okay. That was probably one of that the first, uh, well, it, it was quite a few years ago. Thank you. Okay. Good discussion. Any more questions or comments on the crop insurance? Okay, then the Cass County Joint Water Resource District update. I think Eric did a pretty nice job of, um, of uh, updating where we're at on the lands. We do, I think we have a couple um, offers. So we, we okayed a couple. Uh, appraisal amounts for just compensation mm -hmm. and I think tomorrow we're going to have um, a couple offers coming back to us <coughs> for 
for possible uh, approval. And at our last meeting, uh, we had the land agents there and, and uh, land managers. And they gave us an update of you know how, how things are going, the calls that they're taking, people at the meeting. Generally, um, you know, a lot of questions, but generally they felt pretty good about the process. Um, yeah, and it was pretty positive coming back, so. Do we ever, I don't know, send out any surveys or do anything, customer satisfaction, things we could improve on? We go through this, just a, a thought. You know, I mean, I, I think by and large, people are pretty satisfied with the process when they get done, but it'd be interesting to know if there was something that, you know, some little hiccup that we could fix. Um, you know, I, that's. I think thought. we'll leave that to the outreach and uh, Rocky. There we go. <laughs> Good call. <laughs> Duly noted. Okay, the next item nine. That must be the Minnesota JPA. Yeah, I, the latest on that is um, Mr. Shockley has said that he's probably going to have the draft ready for us to look at here, the modified draft within the next week. Uh, with the idea in mind, first going to. Oh, Moorhead and Moorhead and Clay County for review, and and then off to the watershed too. To, and, you know, I see John just walked in, but yeah, his timing is impeccable. Uh, we were just talking about the Minnesota entities JPA uh, for property acquisition. Do you have anything you'd like to update us? regarding that? Uh, it's just about finished and it'll be distributed out to uh, Clay County, Moorhead, and a copy to the Buffalo Red. So. Great, any questions about that with John or anyone else here? Okay, thank you. Um, any other business? Then I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So in a second? Second. We are adjourned. Thank you all.